Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the lecture series of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. I'm delighted to welcome Professor uh, Seema Shahsari uh, to the center. Seema is an assistant professor of women and gender studies at Wellesley College. She spent significant time, in fact, in the Bay Area before earning her PhD in cultural and social anthropology from Stanford. Uh, she completed a BS in psychology and an MA in women's studies at San Francisco State University, where she actually studied with our own Professor Mina Moala. Um, she additionally worked uh, in a number of organizations and nonprofit groups, uh, the San Francisco Women Against Rape as director of the adult education program, and she also volunteered for several queer women's and immigrant rights organizations around the Bay Area. Before her arrival at Wellesley, uh, she was a postdoctoral fellow in the Women's Gender and Sexuality Program at the University of Houston. Uh, her research, uh, she has researched and written extensively on issues of gender and sexuality, particularly in Iran. Her new research on Iranian transgender refugees is connected to the larger discursive context of the freedom movement in movements in the Middle East and the democratization drive in Iran. She is currently working on a book manuscript titled Blogging in Times of War, Iranian Diaspora, Gender, and Sexuality in Web, uh, web Blogistan. Today she shares with, her, with us her research on this topic uh, in a lecture which is titled Sanctioned Freedom, Web Blogistan, Gender, and Liberation in Times of War. Please join me in welcoming Seema Shahsari to Berkeley. Thank you so much, Professor al for your generous introduction, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I would like to thank the Center for Middle Eastern Studies here at the University of Berkeley um, and other uh, faculty and staff here, in particular Lydia, who has been fantastic, and uh, Lydia Kisling in, uh, in uh, making things happen so smoothly, and also Mejgan, who's no longer here. Uh, so I started uh, communicating with her. And in particular, I would like to thank my mentor of 20 years, Professor Minu Mualem. I took my very first women's studies class with Professor Mualem at San Francisco State University almost two decades ago. And uh, it was Women, the Muslim, and Arab Worlds. And that was enough. I've told that in the <coughs> class, in her class this morning, the same class, that that converted me to the cult of women's studies. So um, <laughs> thank you. And, uh, and I know that you introduced me to the Center for the Middle East Studies. Uh, thank you. For for invitation and uh, I'm very uh, happy to be here. Thanks uh, to my friends who showed up. Uh, some of them are bloggers from Toronto. Uh, well, one. <laughs> uh, who I got to know in Toronto and uh, had a great time with. Um, and also thank you all for being here. Uh, the talk I'm giving today is uh, a part of the manuscript that Professor al uh, mentioned. Uh, and that is based on 24 months of online and offline ethnography uh, uh, in Toronto and Washington, D.C. I worked with Iranian bloggers. And of course, you know, there were over 100,000 uh, Persian blogs uh, at the time that I was doing my uh, field work as a graduate student. Uh, and it's kind of impossible to uh, do an uh, online ethnography of all of those blogs. So I focused my uh, research on bloggers, uh, diasporic bloggers, who wrote about politics of homeland from abroad, in particular from Toronto and Washington, D.C., uh, and those who basically tapped into the opportunities that were provided during the war on terror, and I'll talk about that uh, to tell you what I mean by that. So basically, uh, much like my uh, not defunct blog, my book uh, from which this talk is ex uh, extracted is a product of my political and effective engagement with the Iranian diaspora, revolution, and war. Having lived through the 1979 Iranian revolution and the eight-year war between Iran and Iraq, I left Iran in 1989, the end of a decade known in the post-revolutionary Iran as Dahe Shast, or the 1360s, perhaps the most restrictive period after the revolution when the exigencies of war made, my, uh, made any form of dissent nearly impossible. 1989 was a marker of change, not just uh, in my personal life uh, as an immigrant facing new disciplinary measures and political sensibilities, but also in the world to which I belonged. It marked the beginning of political changes in the post-war uh, post Iran and the shift in political factions after the death of Ayatollah Khomeini, the leader of the Iranian revolution at the time, of course. Uh, 
Liberalization during the two-term presidency of Ayatollah Hashemi Rafsanjani between 1989 to 1997 and the landslide victory of the reformist president Mohammad Khatami in the 1997 presidential election were closely linked to the emergence of the reform movement, labor movement, women's movements, the student movement, and the relative social freedoms. 1989 also marked a series of events in Eastern Europe that came to be known as 1989 revolutions, leading to the so-called fail of communism and the end of the Cold War. A new era was underway. Democratization and econo economic liberalization became buzzwords of a new liberal rationality that replaced the logic of the Cold War with a new normal, which was accelerated market liberalization coupled with freedom through seemingly nonviolent col color revolutions or through militaristic violence. All of these events have had a part in the popularization and the political deployments of Weblogistan. Of course, uh, when you hear about blogging revolution or internet revolutions in the Middle East, uh, cyber enthusiastic accounts seems to lack a kind of social history and uh, they take for granted uh, <laughs> all the, sorry, I got distracted. <laughs> uh, uh, they basically uh, lack a kind of social hi uh, history, uh, a memory, and uh, they assume that just, you know, all these revolutions happen out of nowhere, out of thin air, whereas there is a long history that goes with those. Unquestionably, the emergence, popularity, and political deployments of Weblogistan are implicated in the historical shifts that came about in 2001 with the pronouncement of the war, so-called war on terror. Uh, blogging, Persian blogging, well, in general, blogging became popularized in mid-90s, from 1995 on. Persian blogging started immediately after September 2001, and it was Hossein Darakhshan, known as Hodor, who popularized blogging. Salman Rashidi was the first one who wrote a, a blog in uh, Persian, but Hodor basically made uh, a post on how to write, uh, uh, how to make a weblog in Persian and made a template, uh, basically, and made it uh, much easier for people to serve without knowing any kind of uh, HTML language, having any knowledge of HTML, starting their weblogs. I was one of them later, of course, in uh, 2003, 2004. Um, so it was immediately after September 11, 2001, that Persian blogging became just um, popularized. And like I said, hundreds, uh, over 100,000 uh, weblogs came into being into what was known later as Weblogistan. Um, so, but these uh, 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 occurrences are continuous with interconnected local and transnational cultural, economic, and political formations that precede the events of September 11. Like I mentioned, you know, you can think about the rise of neoliberalism and discourses of freedom uh, that, as I will talk about, very much are implicated in discourses and uh, uh, mainstream representations of Weblogistan. While the events of September 11 and Persian blogging may not have a cause and effect relationship, Weblogistan has been the focus of attention by the US and European based think tanks that provide expertise about Iran to liberal states which are invested in the democratization Iran of Iran through regime change during the so called war on terror. Celebratory accounts of Weblogistan portray it as a site of freedom of speech, stage for rehearsals of democracy, and the bedrock of revolution. In fact, less than a decade before the Iranian Green Movement became known as the so-called Twitter Revolution, and before Twitter and Facebook revolutions um, gained currency in the lexicon of the recent uprisings in the Middle East, blogging revolution, also known as, uh, to some as the Turquoise Revolution, described the role of the Iranian blogosphere in the democratization language reminiscent of the post-Soviet color revolutions, Abbas Marufi, uh, a famous Iranian writer who lives in Europe uh, called blogging a turquoise revolution. The allocation of funding by uh, the US Department of State and uh, the Dutch Parliament, for example, to Iranian diasporic media with the purported aim of promoting democracy in Iran, the proliferation of discussions about a possible regime change by helping the Iranian opposition groups in Iran and its diaspora in the post 9-11 era, and the timely emergence of Persian blogging as a fast medium for transnational, ex uh, transnational exchange of information made web uh, Weblogistan into the spotlight of democracy <coughs> projects. For example, the comedian present Tanger, a non-governmental and neoconservative institution, identifies the Iranian blogosphere as a window through which we, who are assumed to, be, uh, to represent the international community, may monitor Iran. <coughs> 
A 2008 article in CPD's website reads, and I quote, Iran's regime has reasons to worry. With its growing scope and reach, the Iranian blogosphere can give the international community a unique window into the nature of the Islamic Republic, a damning chronicle of its repressive human rights practices, and perhaps most importantly, insights into its intrins intrinsic social, economic, and political vulnerabilities. So why aren't we paying attention, end quote. The fact is that we have been paying attention and monitoring the Iranian blogosphere in different think tanks and research centers. When I say we, I mean you know, the international community. The Berkman Center at Harvard University, which chose Iran as one of the three case studies for its Internet and Democracy project in 2008, is one of the many examples of the way that Iran has become the focus of attention for centers that claim to represent the so-called international community. The three case studies illuminate the geopolitical motivations of research on the internet, investigating the impact of the internet on civic engagement and democratic processes um, in Iran, South Korea, and Ukraine. Berkman Center's research on Ukraine explores the role of cell phones in information sharing and organizing protests during Ukraine's uh, Orange Revolution, while the Iran case study titled Mapping Iran's Online Public, Politics and Culture in the Persian Blogosphere analyzes the, uh, the so-called uh, uh, the quote, a composition of the Iranian blogosphere and its possible impact on political and democratic processes, end quote. The goal of these case studies, as Bergman's, Bergman Center's website reveals, is to draw uh, initial conclusions about the actual impact of technology on democratic events and processes, and to identify questions for further research. The researchers claim that, quote, given the repressive media environment in Iran today, blogs may represent the most open public communications platforms for political discourse, end quote. Celebrated as a technology of liberation by, the, by these knowledge production centers, blogs are expected to be venues for the rapid dissemination of new liberal discourses of freedom and democracy and are deployed as sites of surveillance, discipline, normalization, and regulation according to these discourses. Here in this talk, I suggest that at the post 9-11 phenomenon, Persian language blogging is implicated in discourses of militarism and neoliberalism that interpolate the representable Iranian blogger as a gendered neoliberal subject. I say neoliberal because, as I w uh, will argue here, and many scholars such as Wendy Brown have argued, a significant aspect of neoliberal governmentality is the coupling of notions of freedom and democracy with the neoliberal <laughs> economic agendas. Unlike classical liberalism, neoliberalism extends the economic domain <coughs> to every sphere of life and constructs individuals as entrepreneurial uh, actors. Before I delve into the ethnographic account of the blog, so I want to give a couple of disclaimers um, uh, to clarify a few things. Um, first, uh, of course, when I talk about uh, neoliberal blogger subject, it doesn't mean that every blogger is interpolated or repeats conventions of neoliberal subjecthood. Here I'm talking about a particular uh, group of diasporic bloggers who blogged about politics of homeland and um, uh, tapped into the opportunities that were provided uh, as, expertise, uh, as experts during the par uh, war on terror, and these were actually uh, the most representable blog uh, bloggers uh, in mainstream uh, international <coughs> media. Second, my hesitation to join the cyber enthusiastic accounts about weblogistan, which glorify liberation through blogging, is not meant to ignore the role of the internet and weblogs in the Iranian political scene. While the net has not covered many rural areas and is not accessible to economically disadvantaged uh, urban Iranians, the transnational encounters between a group of educated Iranians in Iran and diaspora give computer-mediated communications a significant role in political exchanges of cosmopolitan Iranians in different parts of the world. Third, uh, by talking about the neoliberal blogger subject, I'm not suggesting that representable uh, bloggers are pawns of global capitalism. My point is that bloggers are not already constituted revolutionary subjects who take part in the politics of homeland, but they become gendered political subjects and entrepreneurs through their participation in seemingly competing discourses such, such as uh, discourses of neoliberalism and nationalism during the war on terror. Rather than analyzing Weblogistan as a space where Iranians 
practice democracy, which is you know, something that a lot of bloggers say, we are practicing democracy through blogging, and freedom of speech, or where, uh, where civil society flourishes, I argue that the blogistan should be analyzed in the context of uh, what I call cyber governmentality, which is a form of transnational governmentality that includes online and offline disciplining and normalizing techniques, utilizes diasporas and media technologies, and employs security as its mechanism of calculation to discipline and regulate gendered and sex neoliberal and nas national subjects. And lastly, I, uh, uh, by no means am I saying that uh, you know, the claims of censorship uh, of internet in Iran are false. Uh, uh, but you know, I want to move away from <coughs> these binaries of op uh, oppression and freedom and look at basically the Blogistan uh, as a transnational um, uh, uh, medium uh, in more nuanced ways. And we can talk about censorship in a question and answer and I can uh, also talk about proxies that uh, the US Department of State uh, provides for Iranian internet users and the kind of uh, censorship practices that the US also imposes through these practices. So uh, let me talk a little bit about mainstream representations of Persian blogging, uh, at least during the time that I was doing my research, which was pretty much the height of activity of a blogger. One of my colleagues, Nikki Akhavan, who was also a blogger and also um, uh, has written her book um, on internet in Iran, uh, uh, we were joking after we both kind of left uh, the world of blogging that uh, among Iranian internet users, it seems to be the post uh, blogging stage. It became uh, friends feed, you know, or uh, other, uh, uh, well, go there, which is Google Reader and so on and so forth. So uh, at the time that I was blogging in mid 2000s, 2004 or 5, 2006, uh, you know, it was kind of the height of active, the heyday of uh, uh, blogging in the blogistan. So um, uh, the way that uh, blogs were represented at the time um, in mainstream international uh, media uh, basically uh, represented the blogistan uh, as basically this tool, uh, uh, well, this liberating technology and most enthusiastic scholarly and journalistic accounts about the popularity of Persian blogging uh, relied on a sharp distinction between the repression of freedom in Iran and the liberal democratic ideals which were assumed to exist in the West. For example, consider this excerpt from Ben McIntyre's uh, Mullahs versus the Bloggers, published in Times Online on October 23, 2005. The author celebrates the internet as a, a new species of protest and introduces the blogistan as the so-called land of free speech, and I quote, if Iran, under the repressive rule of the ultra-conservatives, is silencing the sound of Western pop, uh, in another area of his culture, a wild cacophony of voices has erupted. This is the place Iranians call Weblogistan, a land of noisy and irreverent free speech. The collision between these two sides of Iran, hardline versus online, represents the latest and most important battle over freedom of speech. The outcome will dictate not only the shape of Iran, but also the future of the internet as a political tool, heralding a new species of protest that is entirely irrepressible." End quote. McIntyre's narrative about the clash of online and hard hardline is not an uncommon representation of the role of the internet in Iran. Most mainstream representations about the blogistan <coughs> argue that the lack of freedom of speech in print media in Iran has attracted the young generation of Iranians to the so-called democratic world of uh, blogging. In these accounts, the internet is often depicted as the liberatory force that gives voice to Iranians, especially women, who are assumed to have been silent prior to their access to the internet. Here are some examples of that. Um, this is a quote by <coughs> Lady Sun, one of the pioneering Iranian bloggers who lives in the UK right now. Uh, and she basically says, take an exasperated Iranian woman, add a computer, hook it up to the internet, and you have a voice in a country where it's very hard to be heard. Uh, this is another example, BBC News, web gives a voice to Iranian women. It's all about giving vo a voice, freedom in Farsi weblogs, uh, weblog is some key to democratization of Iran, uh, mullahs versus bloggers, which I just quoted from, uh, the revolution will be blogged, and this is before 2009, of course. This is, you know, uh, before the Green Movement. Uh, 
uh, blogs opening Iranian society, the fight for free speech in Blogistan and beyond, blogs shall set you free, um, and uh, there are many, many examples. So you get the point. Basically, the whole uh, way of representation is that blogging is the way to freedom and democratization of Iran. Um, so, uh, but during the time that I was conducting my research, which was, like I said, the heyday of Blogistan, many Iranian bloggers lived outside of Iran, particularly in, uh, particularly in locations where freedom of speech is assumed to be a right granted to all citizens. So this whole um, notion of lack of freedom, and that is why so many bloggers are blogging, doesn't really apply when you have so many bloggers blogging from North America and Europe, in particular from um, Canada. While Persian, blog, uh, Persian language blogging became quite popular among a certain group of educated Iranians in Iran, some of the most famous and widely read Persian blogs were written in North America and Europe. This includes also, for example, Hoder, uh, the uh, so-called godfather of Persian blogging, the person who I talked about who popularized Persian blogging. At the time, he lived in Toronto, and we can talk about him too. He's in jail in Iran right now, although he keeps taking a lot of breaks from jail and still blogs sometimes, which is, you know, baffles me. Um, surely the increased access to the internet in Iran was an important factor in the rise of blogging among Iranians in Iran and its diaspora. But the visibility of bloggers in mainstream international media cannot be solely attributed to technological developments. Nor can this hyper-visibility be reduced to the usual narrative of lack of freedom of speech in Iran. How does one explain this proliferation of Persian weblogs among diasporic Iranians? Persian blogging among the Iranians in Iran and its diaspora is a historically specific phenomenon that owes its emergence to several contingent factors. In what follows, I will talk about one factor, which is the increased interest among the US and European-based think tanks that provide expertise to the liberal states that are invested in the democratization of Iran during the so-called war on terror, and the personal and political aspirations of a segment of the Iranian diaspora who took advantage of the post 9 11 political atmosphere to provide expertise and testimonials to those who sought uh, such information. While there are several examples that one could present as cases of blogger entrepreneurship in the United States and Europe during the so called war on terror, for the purposes of this talk, I will discuss Blogger Wars, a documentary which features some of the most famous Iranian bloggers in Toronto. Through this example, I address the production of the gendered neoliberal self-entrepreneurs in Weblogistan in relation to the project of militarism. Several participants in this documentary, including the producer, have since been hired by the Dutch, US, and British media to produce and direct programs and reports about Iran. Again, it bears <coughs> emphasizing that unlike its, uh, its mainstream representations, Weblogistan is not a unified front. Iranian um, Persian language bloggers write about many subjects, not all of which are political. Here I'm addressing a particular form, a particular form of subject uh, position which is related to the production of representable subjects in Weblogistan. So let's talk about um, blogger wars. Shortly before the 2005 Iranian presidential elections, this is the first, uh, the first term of Ahmadinejad in 2005, uh, elections Ahmadinejad uh, won over the reformist candidate Moin. Um, so shortly before the elections, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, or CBC, aired a documentary about Iranian bloggers in Canada and Iran. Produced by an Iranian CBC director who at the time lived in Toronto, mm -hmm. Blogger Wars represents Weblogistan as a unified site of resistance to the Islamic Republic of Iran. The film, which relies on the binary, uh, geopolitical designations of freedom in the West and oppression in Iran, situates Hushang, an Iranian blogger in Canada, as a revolutionary soldier in a war being fought uh, from afar. Employing a militaristic language, the anchor introduces the film as follows, and I quote, there are those who are fighting a very different kind of high-tech battle against Iran's repressive regime, and these revolutionaries are launching their fight from right here in Canada. They are reaching millions of Iranians. They believe they can do what no one else has done, bring democracy to Iran. It's called the Blogger Wars, and this is how Hu Shang became one of uh, the generals." End quote. <coughs> 
The anchor then marks the beginning of this so-called war in the year 2000 when Hu Shang, a cartoonist in one of Iran's newspapers, sketched a conservative clergyman and poked fun at his claims about reformist journalists having received money from the CIA. Images of angry protesters are shown in the film, giving the audience the impression that there were widespread riots in the aftermath of the cartoon. What is striking about the documentary is the way that bloggers who are writing about their daily activities or having personal and political disagreements and arguments, which happened a lot in Blogiston, of course, are represented as fighters against the Islamic Republic's uh, tyranny. Bloggers who frequented Iran at the time and lived uh, in Canada were nevertheless portrayed as those who uh, lived there, uh, whose lives were in danger in Iran. Of course, things changed after uh, the second term of Ahmadinejad during the uh, first term too, and uh, there were a lot of back, uh, well, there was a lot of backlash uh, on social freedom. So a lot of these bloggers could no longer go back to Iran. But during the time that I was doing this research and this film was made, it was during Khatami's second term, and a lot of these bloggers, even those who worked for uh, Radio Fardo or uh, Voice of America, uh, and one of whom also worked for a conservative think tank, uh, frequented Iran and US or Iran and Canada. The story Hu Sheng told me is slightly different from the uh, sensationalized depiction of the narrative in Blogger Wars. Hu Sheng, who came to Canada in 2003, was imprisoned for six days in 2000 after publishing his cartoon in a newspaper in Tehran. He was released from prison because of his father's um, connections to influential people. While the anchor tells the audience that that little cartoon forced Hu Sheng to flee, uh, flee to Canada, Hu Sheng did not escape Iran after his arrest in 2000. He stayed in Iran for three years and left with the knowledge of the Iranian state to attend a 2003 cartoon exhibition in Ottawa. The Iranian embassy in Ottawa organized an exhibition of his cartoons <coughs> in response to the American invasion of Iraq. I asked them, the Iranian embassy in Canada that is, to organize an exhibition for me during this conference so that I could defend Islam outside of Iran, end quote, Hu Sheng told me with an impish grin. This was not the only time when Hu Sheng left Iran, uh, when uh, Hu Sheng had left Iran after his arrest in 2000. He traveled to Canada in 2001 to receive the Courage for Editorial Cartooning Award from Cartoonist Rice Network. Hu Sheng didn't stay in Canada in 2001, but in 2003 he decided to stay and apply for refugee status despite his wife's uh, protests or objections to this decision. <coughs> The manner in which Hu Sheng's story is told in the documentary is consonant with the binary discourses that represent a refugee as one who flees the violence in the so-called third world to come to the safety of the so-called first world. Exploring the refugee discourse in Canada, Shirin Razak argues that the uh, gendered imperialist, imperialistic stories in asylum cases reconsolidate the racist notion of the first world helping the third world out of barbarism and social chaos. Despite the fact that most refugee movements take place between neighboring nation states uh, in the so-called third world, the South-North narrative, Razak argues, is the prevalent representation of refugee discourse. Blogger Wars, with its testimonial style interview with Hu Shang and other blogger, relies on this civilizational narrative. The anchor reminds the teary-eyed Hu Shang, who misses his daughter and is upset about being demoted to the status of a blue-collar worker in Canada, um, after immigration, that he's safe and free in Canada. It is as though the requirement to tell the story of flight from Iran as the home of oppression to Canada as the home of liberation is inextricably tied to Hu Shang's claim to legitimacy of presence as a refugee. In addition to repeating the civilizational uh, refugee narratives, Blogger Wars operates within the gendered binary of men assumed to be heterosexual as agents of politics and women also heterosexually imagined as subjects who become representable through sexual liberation. As many fem uh, feminist scholars have argued, militarism <coughs> relies on uh, gender tropes that rearticulate masculinities and femininities. Like many representations of war, Blogger Wars produces different gendered subject positions for bloggers who are hailed as soldiers in a war for democracy and freedom. While Hu Sheng is called the general of this war and Dara, a male student at the time, uh, is called the revolutionary, Ava, 
the only woman among the group of six bloggers, uh, bloggers who were videotaped in this documentary is hailed as a taboo breaker. In response to the interviewer's question about the content of her blog, um, Ava introduces herself and says, quote, I break taboos, I write about sex, I have had premarital sex, end quote. The interviewer repeats Ava's answer with an element of shock and surprise, as if writing about sex is a novel and foreign concept to Iranian women. He, his jaw literally drops, you write about sex. Um, <laughs> It is this discourse about sex that separates the liberated Iranian woman who owes her liberation to being located in Canada and being a blogger from her repressed counterpart in Iran. If the masculine diasporic soldier takes freedom to Iran through his active participation in proper politics, enabled by his freedom of speech in Canada and the internet technologies, the woman blogger finds freedom of expression in writing about sex and telling the truth of her sex uh, in a confessional mode. Not only this form of representation produces and juxtaposes the sexually liberated woman in the West to a repressed Iranian womanhood, it is, it, uh, it all, it is also informed by the recent hype about the so-called sexual revolution in Iran. This misnomer, which is the sexual revolution, ignores the long tradition of discussions about sex and sexuality among women in public spaces, private family gatherings, and literature. Some of the, uh, the examples are these are uh, women's public bathhouses or uh, jalousies, religious gatherings, where women actually explicitly talk about sex and you know, uh, the assumption that women don't know about orgasm is, uh, is interesting. I don't know where all these, uh, you know, Babies came from if women don't know about their sexuality altogether, or you know the talks that oh, I grew up uh, with my mom taking me to jail. Says she was, she comes from a very kind of anti-religious family, but uh, before I was born, she became religious through a friend, and I grew up going to jail. Says with her, and that is where I learned about sex. Actually, you know, going to the jail. <laughs> Um, so, of course, this, uh, uh, this discourse on sexual liberation is gendered. In the film, for example, while Ava's sexual life, uh, life is uh, highlighted, there's no discussion about the sexuality of men. Uh, ironically, one of the uh, uh, bloggers who is uh, interviewed, the student, the revolutionary, uh, is gay. But we don't hear anything about uh, his sexuality. Everything about sexuality is just uh, just concerns uh, the woman blogger. Of course, the producer of this film made another film all about the secret lives of gays in Iran, uh, for which he went to Iran actually. So you know he was traveling back and forth to Iran for making the film. But that was a whole different film, and he won. You know he got promoted and um, got an award for that film too. So. Um, <clears throat> Ironically, Blogger Wars, which criticizes the Iranian state's repression of freedom of speech, censors bloggers' narratives in the process of editing. <coughs> Avo told me, quote, I write about sex was not all that I had said. I said so many things that were kindly edited out. The final version was a two-minute controversial sexy sex theme thing, end quote. While the only subject position available to uh, Ava in this video is her role as a sexually repressed Iranian woman who finds liberation through blogging in Canada, Ava's participation in Weblogistan goes beyond this selective and per uh, popular representation. As I said before, this video was broadcast around the same time that the 2005 presidential election in Iran was approaching. Ava was one of the bloggers who encouraged people uh, or other bloggers to vote and publicly announced that she would vote for the reformist, uh, reformist candidate, Mustafa Moin. She became the target of attacks by those who saw voting as a form of giving the Iranian state undue legitimization, the ones who had boycotted elections. Um, some of the angry comments on Ava's weblog were by those who resented her support for Moin. Ironically, these comments were not just from people who had boycotted the elections, although they too left comments, some accusing women voters of being whores of mullahs, backward or agents of the regime, but from Moin supporters who believed that the reformist candidate did not need the support of whores and tramps. They were concerned that support by someone like Ava, who openly wrote about sexuality on her weblog, would damage Moin's reputation and deface him. They said, Ava Rusho Mibai, you know, you don't need to support him. Some comments in Ava's weblog, um, such comments in Ava's weblog illustrate that while blogging has enabled further political participation, 
for a group of middle class computer literate Iranian bloggers, the particip this participation is not without tensions that also exist in the offline world. Similar to offline encounters, men's participation in the uh, political field in Blogistan is often deemed to be natural, while women's participation uh, is caught between nationalistic discourses of protection and honor and the neoliberal discourses of, free, uh, of liberation from local, liber uh, local repression. Despite Iranian women's active political participation before and after the revolution, it is only through breaking sex taboos and blogging about freedom that many women bloggers become representable subjects in mainstream narratives about Weblogistan. On the other hand, women bloggers are often accused of West toxification if they challenge a heteronormative nuclear family or are encouraged to discuss women's issues if, if they participate in intellectual discussions that are assumed to be the turf of male intellectuals. Actually, as an, an example of this is uh, a graduate student at UC Berkeley at the time who uh, wrote on his weblog, uh, well, he was critiquing uh, an Iranian woman historian, um, scholar of a senior scholar, uh, and he was a graduate student. I don't know if maybe he had the first year graduate student uh, syndrome, which we all had when we were graduate students, but uh, what uh, he basically said was that every few minutes a woman is raped. Why don't Iranian women uh, write about that and leave serious matters to, uh, uh, to the experts? And he considered himself to be an expert on all matters. Foucault, you know, this uh, Iranian historian had written uh, about Foucault. So it's interesting the way that uh, uh, women's issues become very particular issues and then the expertise about these matters are the turf of uh, men who deal with serious, uh, serious academic and um, political concepts. Um, of course, women's participation in politics in Weblogistan is not limited to sexuality or voting, but includes a range of issues that do not get media coverage. As my colleague Nikki Akhavan has argued, the challenges that religious women bloggers or those who are loyal to the Islamic Republic pose to the state and its economic or, or cultural policies do not enter the mainstream accounts on, uh, on Weblogistan. More importantly, I would argue, women's political participation in Iran, including uh, Iranian uh, uh, women bloggers, goes back to long before of the advent of internet in Iran. Many of the Iranian bloggers are journalists or political activists, women's rights activists, who were doing their work long before the popularization of internet in Iran. As I mentioned earlier, the narrator in Blogger Wars portrays blogging as a bold and revolutionary act. We are told that upon his arrival in Canada, Hushan finds something revolutionary, an internet-based internet underground movement that's fighting back against the mullahs of Iran. By hailing bloggers as participants in an uh, underground movement, the documentary misleadingly portrays Persian blogging as a subversive act in an organized movement that is working to overthrow the Iranian state. While there were, and I'm sure still are, bloggers who explicitly favored regime change in Iran, many bloggers who were uh, not represented in mainstream international media did not promote regime change. Indeed, uh, with the exception of two, none of the bloggers whom I interviewed in Washington DC and Toronto, including those who participated in the CBC documentary, which I uh, discussed, expressed any desire for regime change. Granted that the diasporic bloggers who participated in this documentary and whom I re-interviewed did not advocate regime change, one may ask why bloggers participate in these forms of representation. Diasporic Iranian bloggers' participation in mainstream accounts about Weblogistan could be due to several reasons that may, uh, that may not necessarily be related to regime change. Because mainstream media often has a much wider audience than a blogger's regular readership, being featured in mainstream media attracts more visitors and results in higher, uh, higher hits on one's page. This increased traffic, which shows in bloggers' statistic reports, can provide opportunities for entrepreneurship. While the satisfaction of being a popular blogger and gaining social capital may be the motivation for some bloggers to increase their readership, a number of people who use their popularity to mark um, a, a number of people use their popularity to market their weblogs outside of weblogism. Uh, 
for some this form of marketing has been limited to commercial advertisements, uh, but for others it has meant promoting Persian blogging as a revolutionary phenomenon in the market for information during the war on terror when Persian weblogs have received much attention from think tanks, policy institutes, and diasporic opposition organizations. As a result, some bloggers have tapped into the funding opportunities that the so-called war on terror has created for Iranians in Iran and in uh, diaspora. For example, Hushan's popularity in weblogistan and his connections with other Iranians who had left Iran during Khatami's presidency helped him with employment opportunities. He started to work in low rank jobs upon arriving in Toronto, a phase of his life which he bitterly jokes about as the Canadian experience. However, he has since moved up financially as a result of his employment with several different organizations that in one way or another are concerned with the Iranian politics. He joined a group of diasporic Iranians that included a former, a former journalist, a former Iranian president's consultant, a former employee of the Ministry of Guidance, and a senior fellow for the Washington Institute for Near East Policy in Washington, DC, which is a neocon organization. Uh, and this person was also the former founder of the Revolutionary Guard Corps in Iran, by the way. Um, so they got together to propose a satellite television network in Persian. The group asked the European Union for funding and received 15 million euros from the Dutch government. Since launching a television network involved a lot of work, Hushan told me, um, they, uh, the, uh, they basically, uh, the proposed project culminated in a website instead. The Dutch funded media jobs were not the only opportunities with which Hu Shang was presented. He told me that he was offered a job by the US based Iranian opposition group that received funding from the US Department of State to start a website. He was also approached by Voice of America and Radio Farda, which are basically the propaga propaganda wings of the US state, um, but said no to them. In response to my question about why he had accepted to work with a Dutch funded website but rejected Radio Farda and Voice of America, Hu Sheng responded that he consulted the Quran and decided against working with the U.S. Department of State funded media. He said, I consulted the Quran and it wasn't a good idea. Even though the money was not bad, Hu Sheng told me, the decision would have been detrimental to his wife and daughter's well-being in Iran. Since then, uh, after that, actually, his uh, wife and daughter uh, moved to Canada and he did accept jobs that were funded by the U.S. Department of State. Hu Sheng and several other bloggers exemplify the way that some bloggers find career opportunities as bloggers and activists during the so-called war on terror. As the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have shown, the so-called war on terror is not solely fought within the national boundaries of the enemy, but acquires a global face where multiple states, non-state institutions, and individuals participate in a battle against evil, quote unquote evil. Such a spatially ambiguous war employs people in diaspora who act as experts in academic circles, think tanks, media, and policy institutions. As Minu Ma'allam argues, the presence of uh, Muslim immigrants in the West and the threat, so-called threat of Islamic fundamentalism that fills the vo uh, void of the Cold War have given rise to new security concerns which have created a need for expertise in the form of testimonies in media, academic, and political discourses. One cannot dismiss the fact that many Iranians in North America who are faced with discrimination take advantage of the opportunities uh, to provide expertise during the so-called war on terror when information is uh, marketed through uh, neoliberal self-entrepreneurship. This form of entrepreneurship resonates with Foucault's insights um, in discussing the neoliberal turn. Foucault argues that like, cla uh, like classical liberalism, in neoliberalism there is a theory of homo economicus, but he's not at all a partner of exchange. Homo economicus is an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur of himself, and he talks about this in Birth of Biopolitics. Neoliberalism, as many scholars, such as Wendy, uh, Wendy Brown argue, is not just a series of economic policies, but involves the dissemination of market values to all social action. 
while the market and not the state becomes the uh, regulative principle of society, rational action on behalf of every member of the society and legal protection become necessities to a successful economic mechanism within the neoliberal language that privile privileges economic growth. State legitimacy becomes contingent upon the extent and speed of implementation of this economic rationality. Using this, uh, uh, the insights of scholars who have written about neoliberalism, I argue that the willing representable blogger subject in diaspora acts as an entrepreneur who is responsible for her or his economic well-being and markets himself or herself as the source of valuable information. While being subjected to hate crimes and anti-immigrant laws, some diasporic Iranian bloggers take advantage of the opportunities, uh, opportunities provided during the war on terror, which is coupled with the neoliberal market rationality under the guise of American democracy and good governance. These opportunities may offer upward mobility, award, career options, and at times, immigration to Europe and North America, and they're enabled by the need for expertise testimonies and staffing for the private and governmental security industries and propaganda services. Um, this is very tiny, so you probably can't see it, but this is basically uh, New York Times, uh, the job market page. This is from 2005, I believe. Uh, so if you basically entered Farsi uh, in the search uh, engine, you would get jobs that are mainly basically from the CIA or other uh, private security um, uh, companies, uh, a lot of the organizations, cent uh, Central Intelligence Agency or uh, other organizations that are basically in the uh, uh, security sector. Uh, so that was basically the available market for a lot of uh, uh, Iranian immigrants and some Afghani immigrants, people who basically spoke Farsi. Um, by producing and marketing a particular form of knowledge about Iran, the diasporic Iranian bloggers as experts become a part of what Deleuze describes as war machine. This includes think tanks, experts, and non-militant dissident groups that have an, uh, that, uh, who have an investment in regime change, as well as segments of the diaspora, including diasporic bloggers who may not have regime change as their goal, but need to make a living in a neoliberal market economy where social so uh, solidarity turns into security and individuals are expected to be self-responsible entrepreneurs. It is inevitable then that some segments of the Iranian diaspora, particularly those uh, whose Persian language skills and internet proficiency become marketable in the time of war, would tap into uh, tap in gender discourses of militarism and market themselves to private and state security industries and media. The dissemination of freedom through the internet is not, how much time do we have? Yeah, I was told I have an hour. Is that still yeah. good? Okay. <laughs> Not from now, from the time I sorry. <laughs> I need an hour from now. I have a lot to say. So uh, the dissemination of freedom through the internet is not particular to Weblogistan or Iran. The internet has been deployed as the new frontier for freedom projects that normalize the violence of freedom. Um, I'm going to skip this page because I talk too much. Okay. It is by no accident that immediately after the occupation of Iraq, the Spirit of America, a non-profit and non-governmental organization chaired by Senator McCain, uh, created the software Arabic blogging tools to give, quote, voice to those working for freedom and democracy in the Arab world uh, and to enable them to easily connect and share ideas with their peers, end quote. The blogging tools execute what is, uh, what is creators call viral freedom. According to Spirit of America, viral freedom controls weblogs that use the blogging tools in order to transmit the messages of this organization. According to their website, every blog which uses the Arabic blogging tool includes, quote, a space that is under the control of organizations that we, in Spirit of America, work with, such as Friends of Democracy. End quote. Referred to as real estate, this space was designed to promote groups, individual, and news that in the big picture, this is their language, advance freedom, democracy, and peace in the region. 
Not surprisingly, the Spirit of America had a program specifically to train Iraqi women who were assumed to have no experience of freedom previous to occupation of Iraq and prior to their so-called liberation through the internet. Shortly after the implementation of internet democracy training projects in the post-liberation, so-called post-liberation Iraq, the United States focused its attention on propaganda through internet in Iran. During the Bush administration, more than $400 million were allocated to fund covert operations and support for regime change in Iran. And this is according to, uh, 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 to HIVOS, which is a um, uh, uh, research institute in uh, Netherlands. After the 2009 dispute over the Iranian presidential, presidential election and the subsequent uh, street protests, Twitter revolution was hailed for its assumed dissemination of information from Iran to the US and vice versa. John McCain, a pro-war US senator uh, and an ardent supporter of freedom projects through the internet in the Middle East and a, prom uh, and a proponent of neoliberal communication policies such as the Interna uh, Internet Freedom Act gave a tribute to Neda Agha Sultan celebrating YouTube and Twitter for circulating the video of Neda Agha Sultan's death. She was the bystander during the 2009 uh, street protest who was killed and the gory image of her, uh, the moment of her death, which was very fetishizing and very vo voyeuristic, was shown over and over uh, uh, in YouTube, uh, on YouTube and on TV. <coughs> in 2009, appropriating the widely circulated images of the street protests and Neda Agha Sultan's death, the Congress approved funding 120 million dollars for anti-regime broadcasting in Iran. This is again according to Hivos. Obama's administration established the Near East uh, Regional Democracy, or NERD, no offense to nerds in this house, I consider myself <laughs> in 2009 to focus um, primarily on activities, quote unquote, primarily on activities that don't require an uh, in-country presence. This includes a strong focus on support for media, technology, and uh, internet freedom, as well as conferences and trainings for Iranian reformers uh, that may take place outside Iran, end quote. Out of, uh, I'm sorry, I had, uh, uh, I printed this in my hotel and they were running out of ink, so I can't really see, I have to like hold it. <laughs> um, out of the $40 million, um, dollars, uh, $40 million NERD allocation in the fiscal year 2010, $10 million was uh, specified for internet access and freedom. The centrality of internet in the US liberation, so-called liberation projects is reflected in Obama's 2012 Iranian New Year address in which he celebrated Facebook, Twitter, and other internet social networking tools for connecting the Iranian people and Americans together. He announced, quote, the United States will continue to draw attention to the electronic curtain, notice the Cold War language here, the electronic curtain that is cutting the Iranian people off from the world. And we hope that others will join us in advancing a basic freedom for the Iranian people, the freedom to connect with, a, with one another and with their fellow human beings, end quote. Lifting the electronic uh, curtain in Iran while imposing the harshest sanctions in the history of sanctions on the Iranian people raises questions about the paradoxical defense of Iranian people's rights to internet freedom while subjecting Iranian population to slow death, what Lauren Berlant calls slow death, through sanctions. On July 1, 2010, President Obama signed into the law Comprehensive Iranian Sanctions, Accountability and Divestment Act of 2010, CISADA. Um, so this was to amend the sanctions uh, on Iran that were imposed uh, from 1996. So, uh, this added new types of sanctions uh, that Obama has proudly announced to be crippling the Iranian economy, and it really has, I mean, it's uh, impossible to uh, find cancer medicine for many people uh, in Iran. While since the signing of CISADA, the sanctions have made it impossible for people to afford life-saving medicine, Obama has added several provisions to make it easier for American businesses to, prov to provide software and services into Iran that will make it easier for the Iranian people to use the internet, according to um, uh, his website. 
So how does one uh, explain this absurdity of rights and slow that, this kind of freedom, you know, internet freedom, and on the other uh, hand, sanctions? And I'm in my conclusion, so I should be done uh, soon. So let me, uh, I mean, I don't know if I have the answer to uh, this paradox, but uh, I can try to approach it. Uh, and let me uh, just give you another anecdote. I, I just love Senator McCain, so a lot of my uh, quotes are from McCain. <laughs> On July 8, 2008, an Associated Press, uh, press reported asked the U.S. presidential candidate at the time, Senator John McCain, why, despite the sanctions against Iran, U.S. cigarette exports to Iran grew more than tenfold during President Bush's presidency. McCain responded, maybe that's a way of killing them. Mm -hmm. McCain, this was supposedly a joke, a really a racist bad joke. McCain's, respo uh, McCain's response unmasked the conventional account where people are spared, but Iran is assigned the status of evil, uh, evil and delineates the position that the Iranian people <coughs> hold in a milit uh, militant neoliberal order. While the Iranian population is interpolated as a desired consumer of both commodities and liberal ideals of freedom in global capitalism, it is simultaneously produced as one whose killing is, is sanctioned within the rhetoric of the so-called war on terror and in the name of freedom. I call this uh, the politics of rightful killing, which is uh, the politics of unstable life, which is at once imbued with and stripped of liberal universal rights. The politics of rightful killing explains the contemporary political situation in the so-called war on terror, where those, such as the people of Iran, whose rights and protection are presented as raison d'etre of war, are sanctioned to death and therefore live a pending death exactly because of those rights. The politi politics of rightful killing does not uh, replace necropolitics or biopolitics, uh, but exists in the same political terrain where bodies are disciplined, normalized, and where bare life is subjected to death. Bare li I'm using, of course, uh, Giorgio Agamben's language of bare life or necropolitics, which is uh, Achille Mbembe and biopolitics, who goes uh, uh, basically uh, work on biopolitics. So uh, politics of uh, rightful killing refers to the necessary correlate of biopolitics insofar as biopolitics includes in it the way that the life of one depends on the death of the other. It addresses an impending death, but not uh, the bare life, not the life of the shadow slave or the life of the absolute enemy as discussed in Agamben in the camps or um, in, the, uh, in the colonies, plantations or in Palestine. It is not limited to the state of emergency in camps or the state of siege, although it is legitimized under those states. But it extends itself to the state of normalcy, and it is not an exceptional or unique state of lawlessness. The living dead is simultaneously imbued with rights and exposed to an impending death. Um, it is this population that holds in it, the, the living dead basically, uh, that holds in it the promise of civil society and thus the potential of being governed transnationally while simultaneously being subjected to death. So I argue that Weblogistan as a site of production of desiring subjects who practice democracy, a site of normalization of gendered and sex subjects, a site of production of self-entrepreneurs and knowledge, a window for surveillance and dissemination of neoliberal discourses, and a site of articulation of discourses of militarism and nationalism is inevitably intertwined with the politics of rightful killing that concerns not only of the community of Iranian bloggers in cyberspace, but the lives of the Iranian population on the ground. Thank you. Thank you.